Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about Castles and Stonekeep, two games at Interplay. One came out in 95, or 91, and the other came out in 95. I have a little bit of code in the second one, but I really didn't have a lot to do with it. But Sebastian Ola asked about stories about Castles and Stonekeep, and at first I thought, I don't have any. But then I thought, you know what? I kind of do, especially about Stonekeep. So if you're interested in either of those games or just what Interplay was like in the early and mid-90s, this is a video about stories. Because guess what? Turns out I really like talking talking stories. If you, didn't, if you didn't figure that out yet. So let me start with Castles. Uh, Castles came out in 1991. I did not start at Interplay until 1991, and I was only a contractor during that time, which meant I would just come in every couple weeks and drop off code for Bard's Tale construction set, talk to my producer, Tom Decker. I'd see other people, um, chatted with them a little bit, but I do remember meeting Scott Benny, uh, and I met Chris Taylor. In fact, Chris Ta I met Chris Taylor because he was just standing in the room with Tom Decker and I once watching us talk. And finally I turned and introduced myself because I'm like, I don't know who this person is. Um, Scott Benny was the producer and the lead designer on Castles. Very sadly, he passed away last year. So I would love to have talked to him again. He, um, all, he did some design on the second one, I think, but the person, if you want to know more about Castles, the person to talk to now would be Vince DiNardo. Vince Sinardo was a designer on Castles, and he was a designer and the producer on Castles 2, the sequel. And that came out in the next year, I think, 92, although on some platforms, I think it didn't come out until 93. Interestingly, there is a sort of cameo in Fallout. Uh, Vince loved dogs. I love dogs. He would often bring his dog to work, Sasha, very well-behaved dog, and... Sasha appears in Fallout. If you go to the cathedral map, and I think it's near the back, there is a dog. That is Sasha. And somebody told me in Fallout 2 there's an NPC running around calling out for Sasha. I don't know about that, but I can tell you for sure the dog in on the cathedral map is Vince DiNardo's dog, Sasha. Now, I have a lot more stories about Stonekeep. Stonekeep came out in... 1995. It was a big game. It was a huge game for Interplay at the time because they were doing 3D rendering of the dungeons. And they were doing motion cap, uh, full motion capture on, and motion video actually, on all the, um, well, a lot of the creatures. And some of them were, that weren't, were rendered. Like the dragon, of course, was rendered, but the other ones were people dressed up. This was a huge game. For interplay at the time it was super secret people weren't supposed to know about it there was a this was back when we were on susan street in costa mesa there was a hallway you had to go down to to get to the area where the stonekeep offices were and there was a sign above the hallway that said um like restricted access but there was also a sign that said abandon hope all ye who enter here i still remember that sign um i remember going back to look at it uh rob nestler who uh, was the later became like the 3D art director at Interplay and now does that at Obsidian was showing me the game one day and it was just visually amazing. I mean, the back then rendered stuff was not as common and this looked really, really good. So it was interesting when they were recruiting people to appear in the game. I actually kind of wanted to do that, so I went to one of the recruitment sessions and. You didn't get to pick who they were recruiting for. They kind of looked at you and had you say some things. And then they told me that they wanted me to be Wahuka, the little guy, little magic guy. Um, I remember doing this in my rehearsal. I was doing my arms like this. Um, I didn't get it. I know you're shocked. Obviously, I am a professional actor. I didn't get it. Wes Yanagi got it. And push comes to shove. I think Wes is a better Wahooka than I ever would have been, but I was still kind of sad I didn't get to be in the game at all. Now, 
there was another one that I was just too short to be. I'm 6'1", just a little under 6'1". They were looking for people to be the Etten. And by people, I mean they needed two people. And they wanted them to be fairly tall, roughly equal height, because to play the two-headed Etten, they strapped them together. So they picked my producer, Tom Decker. I think he's 6'3", maybe 6'4", and Bill Dugan, another producer. They're both about the same height. Very tall. They had them stand next to each other. They strapped them together around the chest and their legs um, and put a like a cloth over that. So they looked like they had two arms and two heads. Apparently, that was a miserable way to spend hours doing full motion video strapped to another human being. Um, especially when one of the human beings kept making sarcastic comments the whole time about being strapped to another guy. So apparently that was a fun shoot. It was a long shoot. Maybe I dodged a bullet there with the Eden. Now the producer on Stone Keep was Michael Quarles. I super, super admired Michael Quarles. I thought he was a great producer. Um, I asked him a lot of production questions. Um, he and Tom Decker were the biggest influences on me production wise. Um, Tom was my producer on Bard's Tale, Construction Set, and Rags to Riches, and he was the original producer on Fallout, but he had so many other products that I became the producer. I asked Tom tons of questions. I would go ask Michael tons of questions, because when it came to production, I thought he was really, really smart and clever and wise and experienced. And just so you know, we disagreed on many, many things having to be an RPG. I I really disliked that in Stonekeep you were handed a character, a named character, a already created character. I was like, that's awful. That's that's awful. You do not do that. But we disagreed on that, yet we did it at a very friendly and professional level. I would never have done that. He did it. Um, by the way, Michael Quarles was the producer. When I was thinking about leaving, if you go watch the video on I Almost Left um, during the production of Fallout, because I was wasn't paid very much, and I when I discovered how little I was paid, when I tried to actually uh, buy a house, which I already had a down payment for, but I didn't make enough salary to qualify for a loan, for a mortgage, uh, Michael Quarles was the one who convinced the executive producer to pay me more. So you should be thanking Michael Quarles for Fallout because he was instrumental in getting that done. Now, I did some code on Stonekeep, so I didn't get to appear as a character, but I did do some code. I did their critical error handling. Uh, what that was is they had, when games were read off CD-ROM, there were a million different manufacturers of CD-ROMs. And CD-ROMs would frequently fail when asked to read a sector. That was perfectly good. And it was a critical, it was called a critical error. In other words, an interrupt happened. I knew assembly. So they asked me if I could make a critical error handler, which was when that interrupt happened, try reading again uh, a few times. And I actually made that number something they could control. So if you try to read a sector, try to read it again, try to read it again, try to read it again. And only after a number of times would you report an error. If you ever read it correctly, return the data. There were some CD-ROMs that would literally error out a hundred times and then give you an, a, a good reading. A hundred times. It was because see, um, uh, Stonekeep had so much data they filled the disc near the edge. Um, I think it was the inner spindle. I think they went from the outside in. Don't quote me on that. It was near one of the edges, either the inside or the outside edge. And that's where the speed wasn't consistent on some of these cheaper CD-ROMs. And my critical error handler helped them work on people's machines. And this was great. It turned out to be great for me in the long run because we had the exact same problem in Fallout. But some of them were so bad that even when we shipped with a big reread number, we still had people returning discs to us saying that my CD-ROM doesn't read this. And every CD-ROM we had at Interplay would read it. So there were some really bad manufacturers out there. But that was gets me to another thing. Is the great thing I loved about Interplay was people would help each other out. Like, I wasn't part of the, the Stonekeep team, but when they needed that critical error written, and they need, it had to be an assembly, that's how you wrote those handlers, I was like, I'll do it. I'll do that for you. I know how to do that. Similarly, people helped out on Fallout towards the end that didn't have to. They just found out we were having some problems and people would go, I know how to do this thing or, hey, I can help you write that or I'm good at, I know how that scripting language because we use the same scripting language in our game. And people just came to help, even if it meant working after hours. I mean, nowadays people would be like, those poor individuals crunched and were taken advantage of. 
I can tell you back then, we didn't think we were being taken advantage of. And those people offered to help. It's something you see less of. I'm not saying you don't see it at all these days, but you see far less of it. People would nowadays are like, I'm more worried about my work-life balance than helping another team. They should have planned it better. They should have had a better budget. They should have hired more people. All that's true. It was also true that back then I found people were way more willing to help out, to lend a hand. And it mattered. It, it made some of these games ship in a way better state or ship at all. Um, by the way, Chris Taylor was the lead designer on Stonekeep. And we talked all the time. And when he came to Thursday Night Thing, we played GURPS and other games in the evening together, Lynx games. We talked all the time. He was one who came over to Fallout when our lead designer, Scott Campbell, left the company. So as soon as Stonekeep shipped, Chris jumped over on Fallout. Perfect example of because people helped each other out and talked about each other's games and got really involved in each other's games. When it came to, I was in a lurch. Oh my God, I just lost my lead designer. Chris Taylor was like, I'll do it. So those are a lot of my stories. I realize most of those stories are about Stonekeep and not castles. But that stuff I remember. I hope it gives you an insight into what it was like to be at Interplay or a game company in the 90s. And also some stories about castles and Stonekeep, which aren't really games that you know I consider part of my resume, even though I got a little bit of code in Stonekeep. And Sebastian Ola, I hope this helps.